Howard Phillips Lovecraft has inadvertently influenced so much pop culture to a point where you could almost consider him mainstream. After all, who doesn't love maddening tales of eldritch horror? His influence has expanded to such great lengths that his elder gods have left the small haunted towns of Massachusetts and found themselves on the shores of Japan. Japan was, in a way, predisposed to Lovecraft for many reasons. His influence can be seen across movies, manga, anime, and video games, but we're not going to be talking about anything that was inspired by Lovecraft. Well, not entirely. Instead, we'll be taking a direct approach, looking at direct adaptations of Lovecraft in Japanese. Because it may surprise you to know that there's a lot more than you might think. So crack open your Necronomicons, grab your unfortunately named cats. This is Lovecraft in Japan. Now, Lovecraft has actually had a surprisingly long history of adaptations in Japan. He's been translated into Japanese as early as the 1940s. And in 1958, one of Lovecraft's more famous novellas would be published in Sekai Kyofu Shosetsu Zenshu, a collection of short horror stories from around the world. This particular collection contained a translation of the classic Lovecraft story, The Dunwich Horror. The original novella is primarily centered around strange incidents stemming from the Whatley family in the Massachusetts town of Dunwich. The Whatley family gets involved with a little entity known as Yog sothoth that leads to the birth of a hideous half-man, half-monster creature. The Whatley creature's appearance and rampage is the story's climax, and appropriately put the Dunwich horror into the collection's kaiju-themed fifth volume. At the time it was published, Godzilla had just been released about four years prior. Japan was about to enter its Dai Kaiju boom of the 60s. So, of course, the Dunwich Horror would have a great deal of appeal to its readers. And just one of those inspired readers was Shigeru Mizuki. Mizuki would adapt the Dunwich Horror into a manga with Chittei no Ashioto, or Footsteps from the Depths of the Earth. The story would not just undergo a name change, but also a change of setting, too. The east coast town of Dunwich has been moved to the Japanese mountain village of Hatsume, and all the characters' names were appropriately changed with it. Even proper Lovecraftian concepts like the Necronomicon and Yog sothoth have been changed to the terrifying Shiro Kaiki and the monstrous Yokai Yogurt. Despite the localization, the story apparently remains intact. I say apparently because I haven't read it. The book has yet to be translated, but you can find plenty of information about it, and basically everything else related to Mizuki, on Zach Davison's blog, Hyaku Monogatari Kaidan Kai. But this wasn't the only time that the Dunwich Horror was adapted in Japan. In 2007, it would be adapted into an anthology OVA of the same name. H.P. Lovecraft's The Dunwich Horror and Other Stories is a 40-minute... anime? Look, if it wasn't immediately apparent, The Dunwich OVA isn't animated traditionally. In fact, one could say it isn't animated at all. Being somewhere between claymation and crude puppetry, The Dunwich OVA is actually pretty impressively put together for a seemingly primitive technique. This was part of Toei Animation's Ganame project with publisher Gentosha. Between 2004 and 2007, they would release a series of artistically driven original movies, with some high-profile creators like Keita Amamiya and Yoshitaka Amano attached to them. The Dunwich OVA contains not just the Dunwich horror, but also two short stories that bookend it, those two being The Picture in the House and The Festival. Unlike Mizuki's adaptation, 
This retains the names and locations of the original short story. While faithful to the source material, these are short films. The longest section, a 20 minute adaptation of the Dunwich Horror, is a hyper condensed version of the novella. It hits all the iconic parts of the story, Wilbur Whatley's transformation, his brother's hideous appearance, but in terms of production it's a little rough. The model work seems to vary in quality from segment to segment, with the actual Dunwich horror part being the worst, and the festival by far being the best. If I had to guess, I would say that this Dunwich segment was created before the other two, and gave the creator plenty of practice working with these models. Festival is the polar opposite. It has impressively crafted models and sets. It's nearly devoid of any dialogue, and completely nails its unsettling tone. Even if the quality can vary, the actual craft is unique. Granted, these sets give off a very Eastern European vibe that's a pretty far cry from 1920s New England, but everything is still sculpted with style and care. All three stories run off of atmosphere much more so than actual plot which is totally what it should do given the source material. The claymation puppetry hybrid style is inherently off-putting, which is something that works well for me in horror. I've long since passed the point of being scared by any media, really. But if you want to give me the creeps, make something that looks like this, and not something that looks like this. Like a lot of things I talk about, you probably already know if this looks like your thing. And if this looks like your thing, you can check out the other Ganame entries out there. Particularly Amamiya's G9 and Amano's Tori no Uta. The Dunwich OVA is an interesting experiment. How well it works depends on the segment and the person. But personally, this was right up my alley. It captures the atmosphere of Lovecraft while glossing over the story to a certain degree. Now, a lot had changed between Mizuki's 1962 manga and Toei's 2007 OVA, especially when it comes to Lovecraft. Back when Chiete no Ashioto was published, the old gods were barely even on the radar of anyone in Japan. That would change in 1986 with the release of the tabletop RPG Call of Cthulhu, which struck a chord with otaku around the country. Gameplay mechanics would find their ways into JRPGs, like La Plesas no Mao, and even more modern anime like Naruko-san have seemingly been more inspired by the geek subculture created by Call of Cthulhu than the actual Lovecraft stories. Also, this show was bad and I hate it, but this is to be expected. When the game came out, there were still sections of Lovecraft's work left untranslated into Japanese. However, that would change thanks to one man, Ken Asamatsu. Ken was first inspired by Lovecraft during a trip to Rhode Island, during which he discovered the case of Charles Dexter Ward, he would then take that inspiration to his high school, where he and his friends would write Lovecraft fanzines and translate the missing parts of his work into Japanese. Just as Otaku became enamored with Call of Cthulhu, Asamatsu was overseeing the official translation of Lovecraft's complete body of work into Japanese. At the same time, he also began writing his own original Lovecraft-inspired novels. Following in his idol's footsteps, Asamatsu would open the Cthulhu mythos to writers across Japan with his anthology series Layers of the Hidden Gods. Famous horror writers from across the country would contribute to the series, but most notably was one Chiaki J. Konaka. Konaka is one of the most unique screenwriters in Japan, being at the helm of anime like Serial Experiments Lane or The Big O. He's also one of the most notable names when it comes to Japan's Cthulhu mythos. I've already talked about Maribito, 
which is possibly one of the best Lovecraft-inspired J-horror films. You can pretty much guarantee that if you're watching something written by Konaka, there's probably a little bit of Lovecraft under the surface. So naturally, no other writer was better suited to write a TV adaptation of The Shadow over Innsmouth. This might actually be the most obscure thing I've covered on this channel. Inzmasu o Kage is a 1992 TV adaptation of Lovecraft's The Shadow over Innsmouth. It is essentially a modern Japanese retelling of the story. While it seems to diverge from the source material literally in a lot of ways, the core of the story appears to be kept intact. And I'm using this vague language because... There's no subtitles for this. The only reason I have access to it is because somebody uploaded it to YouTube in extremely low quality. So you can watch this in stunning 240p, with the audio occasionally dropping out. This is the only version that we have available in the West for now. An HD version might exist somewhere on a Japanese streaming website, but they don't accept IP addresses from out of Japan and it also blocks my VPN. Believe me, I've tried every possible solution to get a better quality rip of this movie. From the three Japanese courses taken over two years ago, and a general knowledge of the original story, I've pieced together the plot best I can. The Kage over Innsmouth now tells the story of Hirata, a photographer from Tokyo who begins to uncover a sinister mystery tying his heritage back to a small Japanese coastal town of Inzmatsu. All the fictional town names have been preserved, along with any explicit reference to the Cthulhu mythos. The basic plot even remains the same, again, from at least what I can tell. There is a love interest thrown in, who also happens to wear the most 90s outfit possible, but as far as the general structure of a man seeing some weird shit go down in a small town, Innsmouth stays true. Which is impressive considering that the film is working with very little time and extremely low budget. It has comically cheap special effects, but that's kind of what gives it some charm. It's almost endearing seeing guys in rubber fish makeup running around and having the film treat it like this is the scariest thing in the world. It also moves at a pretty brisk pace. Given that I could only, maybe, catch a word or two in every other sentence, this would have been torture if the film was extremely talky. Sure, there are parts that are explicitly just exposition. I can tell that even as a non-native speaker. But these are generally offset by scenes built more around atmosphere and suspense, which, admittedly, never comes close to genuine horror. But it also never fails to deliver on the cheese. If there is an atmosphere to this movie, it's cheesy early 90s television. And if you dig that and have read the original story, then it's almost worth watching this unsubtitled. With a cleaner rip of this movie and subtitles, the Kage over Innsmouth might actually really shine. It's pretty well shot and makes good use of horror movie lighting. Shame that this is hard to tell when the movie looks like it was filmed on a potato. In fact, if this had a slightly higher budget, it could be a real classic. For what it is, and for what condition we have it in, the Shadow Over Innsmouth is a neat little oddity that's worth checking out. Maybe one day we'll actually have a decent looking subtitled release, and I can finally find out that I've been wrong about the whole plot of this movie. 
Konaka would later go on to remake this film, in the loosest of senses, into an episode of Digimon. That's right, Digimon, specifically season 2. In fact, recycling and reimagining Lovecraft's plot points is something Konaka does fairly often, usually just as a quick way to get the creative ball rolling. I don't have the desire to create an original world for each new production, so when it's effective, I use Lovecraft's elements. Drawing from Lovecraft's stories or mythos often gives authors a much stronger foundation to build their work off of. And this was actually the case with manga author Go Tanabe. While excelling at art, Tanabe struggled to invent his own stories. His editor suggested that Tanabe start drawing adaptations and began introducing him to Lovecraft's bibliography. Very, very quickly, Tanabe became the go-to guy to draw Lovecraft. Since 2007, Gotenabe has been adapting Lovecraftian tales into manga, and so far only two have been released into English. The first being a compilation of short stories, and the second being one of Lovecraft's most famous stories, At the Mountains of Madness. The novella follows an Antarctic expedition, as they uncover the gruesome remains of previous explorers alongside the unearthly carcasses of Elder Things. This leads the team deeper into the mountains, plunging further into an ancient history forgotten by mankind. By virtue of being an adaptation of a western work, the manga already separates itself from the crowd of other horror series. But regardless of its setting, Tanabe's art alone makes At the Mountains of Madness stand apart. Right away, the manga invokes an almost cinematic feeling with the wide establishing shot panels and the manga's title drop, it could be easily used as the storyboards for the opening to a feature film, which of course the book begins by reminding us of the current status of that project. In addition to its cinematic pace, Tanabe is also able to draw horrific abominations with ease. It's hard to say if his style has always been suited to eldritch terrors, or if he developed that way because of his Lovecraft adaptations. In either case, he has a real talent for drawing the undrawable. But that's not to sell Tanabe's, comparatively, more mundane art short. The characters and time period are brought to life with authenticity. He never strays into the cartoony or more typical manga styles. The realism he brings to each scene feels entirely appropriate for this kind of story. The worldly elements are drawn in a style grounded to reality, making the otherworldly elements stand out as weird and frightening in their own right. The manga is an incredibly faithful adaptation of the book. Unlike Innsmouth or the Dunwich manga, there aren't any changes to localize this story to a more Japanese setting. And more importantly, the manga doesn't have to worry about length, unlike the Dunwich OVA. Sure, there's some trimming, but ultimately, two volumes of manga is the perfect length to adapt a short novella. There's a treasure trove of Tanabe's work just waiting to be brought into English. What is available has been brought to us through the efforts of professional translator Zach Davison. In addition to chronicling Mizuki's Dunwich adaptation, he was also nice enough to answer some questions that I had about Tanabe and Lovecraft's influence in Japan. If you're interested in hearing more about this, you can check out the interview I did with him a while back, in which he talks briefly about Tanabe, but mostly about Mizuki. But who can blame him? There's plenty more Tanabe Lovecraft available, including an adaptation of Call of Cthulhu itself, and one of my favorite stories, The Shadow Over Innsmouth and chances are we won't get more of it if the manga isn't successful over here. So pick up a copy of The Mountains of Madness. If not to support the author, then just because it's a fantastic addition to anyone's shelf. I haven't been paid to say this, but Dark Horse, if you're listening, I would not mind to be paid to say this. Lovecraft has influenced and will continue to influence creators around the world. 
But just what have we learned by diving into the maddening history of Lovecraft in Japan? 